Hello, book lovers. Welcome to another live session of our guided readings of the novel The Professor by Charlotte Bronte. I hope you're doing well. I hope you have um, something to drink. I have just made some tea, some green tea. The day outside is beautiful. Maybe you can see some of the reflection on the glass behind me. It's a beautiful uh, blue sky, sunny day, although still cold. And I'm very happy to be here to continue reading this novel by Charlotte Bronte with you as part of the literary cycle dedicated to Charlotte Bronte at Books and Culture. Uh, so let me know if you're watching live. I love uh, to interact with book lovers in these live sessions. Uh, today we're going to read chapters 10, 11, and 12. Last time we read chapters 7, 8, and 9. And last time we went to Brussels, Belgium. So William Crimsworth, the protagonist in The Professor, began a new phase in his life. He, he used his letter of introduction, the letter of, of he used the letter of introduction uh, written by Mr. Hunston. Um, he traveled to Belgium, and um, we read last time the first impressions of um, William Crimsworth. And it's, it was very interesting to see how the reality, his perception of reality, was filtered by his happiness with his freedom. He was so happy to be finally free from the abusive relationship with his brother and from the tedious work at uh, X, the city of X. Um, he's so happy that whatever he sees is filtered by this happiness uh, with his freedom. Um, so for a few days, for a couple of days, he pretends to be a carefree traveler. That's in fact what he wanted to be, but he cannot. He has to earn his living so after a couple of days, um, he has to get back to work. So he gets a job as an English teacher in Monsieur Pelé's Pensionnat for Boys. So that's the new phase in his new career. He becomes an English teacher. And that was very interesting to read last time, the um, education system, and more interestingly, the um, teaching methodologies um, in this case, in the case of William, of a foreign language, he's teaching English to French-speaking Belgian boys, are so different from um, ours nowadays in the 21st century. And, um, of course, we have to put the work into its context. So we're reading about a professor, that's how they called teachers in Belgium in the 1840s, maybe even prior to that. Uh, but reading is a window to the past, right? So I think it's so interesting for us 21st century readers to be able to become more familiarized with the way that education or the teaching uh, of a new language, of a um, foreign language used to be like. And um, compare with our own time. Um, and when I say that, I say in a critical way, but not in a judgmental way. That's a very big difference between criticism and judgment. So we're not judging the way William Crimsworth used to teach because that was part of his reality. Um, but we are um, looking at it with a critical 21st century I. So what consisted of uh, foreign language education, mainly in the 19th century, was memorization, repetition, reading out loud, um, focus on flawless pronunciation. And nowadays, the focus is on communication, right? On uh, getting your message across despite different accent, accents. Um, pronunciation, yes, it's, it's important as long as it hinders understanding. Um, but there is no need to have a flawless pronunciation. So you see how, um, how priorities in the learning of a new language have changed throughout this, um, 
this decades, right? This over a, over a century. So that's quite interesting. And we're going to keep reading about um, the um, realities of a classroom uh, in a Belgian pensionat in the in two Belgian pensionats in the nineteenth uh, century. Uh, so that's interesting. So William now in his new job he has his own small room, which is very happy about, and he has two windows, two windows. So he's also super happy about that. But one of the windows is shut, is nailed with the boards. Uh, because that window looks over the garden of the girl's pensionat next door. And it would not be proper for him, a single man, to be able to look at the girls playing um, down in the garden. So he cannot see. So he fantasizes about this garden. The garden is re uh, repeated several times. And remember, in literature, there's no such thing as random repetition. If something is repeated... Think about it. There is an extra layer of meaning. So he mentions the garden many times. And first the garden is blocked to him. And he romanticizes that place where the girls are free. He can hear them. And he even says that the girls sound um, louder than the boys playing. Uh, and we'll, we'll talk more about the garden today. The garden is, of course, one of... Um, literature's most used, explored um, uh, symbols, right? It refers back. We cannot read a garden without thinking of the Garden of Eden, the paradise, right? Where Adam and Eve um, first lived prior to the fall of man, to the first sin, as we read in the Bible. The Bible is a very important reference for literary scholars, so we'll see how it goes. Um, we also talked and discussed uh, William's culture shock. So it's the first time that he is abroad. And it's clear that he sees himself as superior because he is an English Protestant man in contrast to the Belgian Catholic students. And also, there's also... Um, a different hierarchy between the French, um, French speaking. So um, the I don't want, I don't even want to say that, but the real French. So the the ones that came from France and are living in, in Belgium, and the Belgium French speaking people. So there's a hierarchy there, which is um, um, cultural and interesting to to discuss, uh, but. William feels himself superior to them all, and it becomes even more apparent in the sections we'll read today, um, especially in regard to religion. So he is a Protestant man, and of course this book has been written by a Protestant author, Charlotte Bronte. So there is this clear assumption that, and the book is also written in the first person narrative, so we read it through um, William's perspective. But there is this overlying uh, assumption that uh, Catholicism is bad and Protestantism is good. Very simple terms. We'll talk more about that today. Um, and at the end of the session uh, last time, we read about how he met Mademoiselle Zoraide Reuter, the head headmistress of the girls' pensionat, the one next door. And she engages him to teach English at the girls' pensionat as well. So um, he's very excited about stepping to the other side of seeing the uh, day-to-day the -day life in a girls' pensionat now that he's been teaching at the boys. Um, and also to have the chance to get a glimpse at that garden that has been blocked to him. And this is where we left off last time. And today we're reading chapters 10, 11, and 12. So let's do that. Grab your copies of the professor and let's take a look at chapter 10. So here he goes, chapter 10. Next day, the morning hours seemed to pass very slowly at Monsieur Pellet's. 
I wanted the afternoon to come that I might go again to the neighboring pensionnat and give my first lesson within its pleasant precincts, for pleasant they appeared to me. At noon, the hour of recreation arrived. At one o'clock, we had lunch. This got on the time, and at last, St. Gudul's deep bell tolling slowly too marked the moment for which I had been waiting. So he would be teaching the boys in the morning and a few days during the week he would be teaching the girls in the afternoon. And he was anticipating that moment, expecting that moment with anxiety and um, excitement, rather. Um, and he really romanticizes the girls' pensionat. So let's see the contrast between the ideal in his mind and the reality. At the foot of the narrow back stairs that descended from my room, I met Monsieur Pelé. Comme vous avez l'air rayonnant, said he. Je ne vous ai jamais vu aussi gay. Qu'est-ce qu'il... Qu'est-ce... Excuse my French, let's see. Que s'est-il donc passé? Apparemment que j'aime les changements, replied I. Replied I. Ah, je comprends. C'est cela. Soyez sage seulement. Vous êtes bien jeune. Trop jeune pour les rôles que vous allez jouer. Il faut prendre garde, savez-vous? Mais quel danger y a-t-il? Je n'en sais rien. Je ne vous laissez pas aller à de vives impressions. Voilà tout. Ne vous laissez pas aller à de vives impressions. Voilà tout. So they have this conversation that he's, um, Monsieur Peru says that um, William is looking radiant today. He's never seen him that happy. And he says, well, I think I like uh, changes. And he says, okay, I get what you mean, but um, uh, beware, okay? Don't let yourself be carried away by impressions. This is what they talk about. I laughed. A sentiment of exquisite pleasure played over my nerves at the thought that vives impressions were likely to be created. It was the deadness, the sameness of life's daily ongoings that had hitherto been my bane. My blouse-clad élève in the boys' seminary never stirred in me any vives impressions, except it might be occasionally some of anger. I broke from Monsieur Pelé, and as I strode down the passage, he followed me with one of his laughs a very French, rakish, mocking sound. Um, the French are stereotypically depicted here as um, rakish, um, the women as coquettish. Um, so we have to remember that we're reading this through William's perspective. And this is the first time that he goes abroad. So he has probably had a lot of um, stereotypical input regarding French and Belgians. Uh, so he will have to um, eventually come to terms with reality in opposition to this predetermined, this prejudged um, conceptions he has had in his mind. Really a prejudice, right? Um, and again, after a few days, I don't remember how long, he's probably weeks, um, after, so he's been a few weeks working at the boys' pensionnat, reality has become dull again, right? And he wants impressions, vivid impressions. He wants something new. And that uh, materializes in the form of the next door girls, uh, not comment, girls' pensionnat. Again, I stood at the neighboring door and soon was readmitted into the cheerful passage with its clear dove color imitation marble walls. I followed the portress and descending a step and making a turn, I found myself in a sort of corridor. A side door opened. Mademoiselle Reuter's little figure, as graceful as it was plump, appeared. I could now see her dress in full daylight. A neat, simple mousseline laine gown fitted her compact round shape to perfection. Delicate little collar and manchette of lace, trim Parisian rodequin, showed her neck, wrists and feet to complete advantage. But now, but how grave was her face as she came suddenly upon me. Solicitude and business were in her eye. On her forehead, she looked almost stern. Her bonjour, monsieur was quite polite, but so orderly, so commonplace, it spread directly a cool, damp towel over my vives impression. 
The servant turned back when her mistress appeared, and I walked slowly along the corridor side by side with Mademoiselle Reuter. A damp cloth <laughs> to quench his romantic ideals in his head, the, um, the expectation of vives impressions or vivid impressions when he comes to this very matter-of-fact business-like um, uh, interaction with uh, the headmistress. Monsieur will give a lesson in the first class today, said she. Dictation or reading will perhaps be the best thing to begin with, for those are the easiest forms of communicating instruction in a foreign language. And at the first, a master naturally feels a little unsettled. She was quite right, as I had found from experience. It only remained for me to acquiesce. We proceeded now in silence. The corridor terminated in a whole large, lofty, and square. A glass door on one side showed within a long, narrow refect showed within a long, narrow refectory, with tables, an armoire, and two lamps. It was empty. Large glass doors in front opened on the playground and garden. A broad staircase ascended parallel on the opposite side. The remaining wall showed a pair of great folding doors, now closed and admitting, doubtless, to the glasses. Mademoiselle Reuter turned her eye laterally on me to ascertain probably whether I was collected enough to be ushered into her sanctum sanctorum. I suppose she judged me to be in a tolerable state of self-government, for she opened the door, and I followed her through. A rustling sound of uprising greeted our entrance. Without looking to the right or left, I walked straight up the lane between two sets of benches and desks and took possession of the empty chair, an isolated desk raised on an estrade, of one step high so as to command one division. It was a clear division, hierarchical division. The professor was on one step higher than the students, right? So it is um, um, from up, to bottom, right? So the um, professor uh, remains in this place of authority, uh, metaphorically and physically, because he's one step higher than the, the children. The other division being under the surveillance of a maîtresse similarly elevated. At the back of the strait and attached to a movable partition dividing this schoolroom from another beyond was a large tableau of wood painted black and varnished. A thick crayon of white chalk lay on my desk for the convenience of elucidating any grammatical or verbal obscurity which might occur in my lessons by writing it upon the tableau. A wet sponge appeared beside the chalk to enable me to efface the marks when they had served the purpose intended. So it's a blackboard, right? I carefully and deliberately made these observations before allowing myself to take one glance at the benches before me. Having handled the crayon, looked back at the tableau, fingered the sponge in order to ascertain that it was in a right state of moisture, I found myself cool enough to admit of looking calmly up and gazing deliberately round me. So he passes straight through. He doesn't look at the girls. He's trying to maintain his self-control. He looks at the... Um, the board, the chalk, the sponge. <laughs> and when he feels he's ready to encounter the gazes of those girls, he looks up, right? He does not want to, um, the, he does not want his students, female students, to see him um, uh, out of temper or out of control or even um, embarrassed. And first I observed that Mademoiselle Reuter had already glided away she was nowhere visible. A maîtresse or teacher, the one who occupied the corresponding estrade to my own, alone remained to keep guard over me. She was a little in the shade, and with my short sight, I could only see that she was of thin, bony figure and rather tallowy complexion, and that her attitude, as she said, partook equally of listlessness and affectation. More obvious, more prominent, shown on by the full light of the large window were the occupants of the benches just before me, of whom some were girls of 14, 15, 16, some young women from 18, as it appeared to me, up to 20. 
the most modest attire, the simplest fashion of wearing the hair were apparent in all. And good features, ruddy, blooming complexions, large and brilliant eyes, forms full even to solidity seemed to abound. I did not bear the first view like a stoic. I was dazzled. My eyes fell, and in a voice somewhat too low, I murmured, Prenez vos cahiers de dictée, mademoiselle. Not so had I bid the boys at Pelé's take their reading books. A rustle followed, and an opening of desks, behind the lifted lids which momentarily screened the hands bent down to search for exercise books, I heard tittering and whispers. Eulalie, je suis prête à pas me de rire, observed one. Comme il a rougi en parlant. Oui, c'est un véritable blanc bec. And blanc bec literally means uh, white beak. And this is an expression used to refer to a young man without experience, but wanting to show off command, um, self-worth, right? Um, so I think it's quite an interesting expression. So the girls are judging him, right? Oh, look how he, I'm about to, to laugh. Look how he roars when he speaks. Yeah, he's a true white beak. Tais-toi, Hortense. Il nous écoute. And now the lid sank and the heads reappeared. I had marked three, the whisperers, and I did not scruple to take a very steady look at them as they emerged from their temporary eclipse. It is astonishing what ease and courage their little phrases of flippancy had given me. The idea by which I had been awed was that the youthful beings before me, with their dark nun-like robes and softly braided hair, were a kind of half-angels. The light titter, the giddy whisper, had already in some measure relieved my mind of that fond and oppressive fancy. So he had idealized the girls as angel-like creatures. So when he realized that they are not, they were whispering and making fun of him, you know, the veil um, was lifted and he became confident. You know, I can deal with his students. They're just like any other students. The three I allude to were just in front, within half a yard of my straight, and were among the most womanly looking present. Their names I knew afterwards and may as well mention now. They were Eulalie, Hortense, Caroline. Eulalie was tall and very finely shaped. She was fair and her features were those of a low country Madonna. Many a figure de vierge have I seen in Dutch pictures exactly resembling hers. There were no angles in her shape or in her face. All was curve and roundness. Neither thought, sentiment, nor passion disturbed by line or flushed the equality of her pale, clear skin. Her noble bust heaved with her regular breathing. Her eyes moved a little. By these evidences of life alone could I have distinguished her from some large, handsome figure molded in wax. Hortense was of middle size and stout. Her form was ungraceful, her face striking, more alive and brilliant than Eulalie's. Her hair was dark brown, her complexion richly colored. There were frolic and mischief in her eye. Consistency and good sense she might possess, but none of her features betokened those qualities. Caroline was little, though evidently full-grown, raven black hair, very dark eyes, absolutely regular features, with a colorless olive complexion, clear as to the face and sallow about the neck, forming her that assemblage of points whose union many persons regard as the perfection of beauty. How, with the tintless pallor of her skin and the classic straightness of her lineaments, she managed to look sensual, I don't know. I think her lips and eyes contrived the affair between them, and the result left no uncertainty on the beholder's mind. She was sensual now, and in ten years' time she would be coarse, promise plain was written in her face of much future folly. So see how judgmental William is, right? He's looking at the students, describing them, but not in a neutral tone. He really puts all of his preconceived ideas, stereotypes, prejudice on this um, um, descriptions. See how he describes Caroline as um, someone who would uh, be uh, falling into vice or folly and because of that would lose her youth quite uh, soon and become uh, plain. 
So if I looked at these girls with little scruple, they looked at me with still less. Eulalie raised her unmoved eye to mine and seemed to expect, passively but securely, an impromptu tribute to her majestic charms. Hortense regarded me boldly and giggled at the same time, all she said with an air of impudent freedom. Dictez-nous quelque chose de facile pour commencer, monsieur. Caroline shook her loose ringlets of abundant but somewhat coarse hair over her rolling black eyes. Parting her lips as full as those of a hot-blooded maroon, she showed her well-set teeth sparkling between them and treated me at the same time to a smile de sa façon. Beautiful as Pauline Bourguese, she looked at the moment scarcely purer than Lucrèce de Borgia. Look at the um, uh, comparisons here. So she looked as beautiful as Pauline Borghese, who was Napoleon Bonaparte's sister. So very beautiful um, and rich, luxurious. She looked scarcely purer. So not purer than Lucrèce de Borgia, the uh, adulteress, right? So he's judging her. Caroline was of noble family. I heard her lady mother's character afterwards, and then I ceased to wonder at the precocious accomplishments of the daughter. These three, I, I at once saw, deemed themselves the queens of the school, the mean girls from the 19th century, right? So some things never changed. And conceived that by their splendor, they threw all the rest into the shade. In less than five minutes, they had thus reviewed to me their characters, and in less than five minutes, I had buckled on a breastplate of steely indifference and let down a visor of impassable austerity. Take your pens and commence writing, said I, in as dry and trite a voice as if I had been addressing only Jules van der Kelkov and company, the boys. The dictate now commenced. My three bells interrupted me perpetually with little silly questions and uncalled for remarks, to some of which I made no answer, and to others replied very quietly and briefly. Comment dit-on point en virule en anglais, monsieur? Semicolon, mademoiselle. Semicolon? Ah, comme c'est drôle, giggle. Mais monsieur, oh, j'ai une si mauvaise plume, impossible, impossible d'écrire. Mais monsieur, je ne sais pas suivre. Vous allez si vite. Je n'ai je n'ai rien compris moi. Here a general murmur arose, and the teacher, opening her lips for the first time, ejaculated, "Silence, mademoiselle." No silence followed. On the contrary, the three ladies in front began to talk more loudly. C'est si difficile l'anglais. Je déteste la dictée. Quel ennui d'écrire quelque chose que l'on ne comprend pas. Some of those behind left. A degree of confusion began to pervade the class. It was necessary to take prompt measures. So the class was a mess. It was chaos, even more than the boys' uh, classroom. It's interesting for us, perhaps we idealize students in the past, like nowadays students are chaotic and um, they don't respect their teachers and believe that back then things were strict and the students would listen to their masters and behave. Well, here is proof that that was not the case. Contemporary proof. So Charles Bronte worked as a, a teacher in Brussels. She worked as a governess. I'm sure she speaks from uh, personal experience how she had to deal with different and difficult types of students. So that's quite interesting, don't you think? Donnez-moi votre cahier, said I to Eulalie in an abrupt tone, and bending over, I took it before she had time to give it. Et vous, mademoiselle, donnez-moi le vôtre, continued I more mildly, addressing a little pale, plain-looking girl who sat in the first row of, of the other division and whom I had remarked as being at once the ugliest and the most attentive in the room. She rose up, walked over to me, and delivered her book with a grave, modest curtsy. I glanced over the two dictations. Eulalie's was blurred, blotted, and full of silly mistakes. Sylvie's, such was the name of the ugly little girl, was clearly written. It contained no error against sense and but few faults of orthography. I coolly read aloud both exercises, 
marking the folds. Then I looked at Eulalie. C'est en deux, said I, and I deliberately tore her dictation in four parts and presented her with the fragments. I returned Sylvie her book with a smile, saying, C'est bien, je suis content de vous. Sylvie looked calmly pleased. Eulalie swelled like an incensed turkey, but the mutiny was quelled. The conceited coquetry and futile flirtation of the first bench were exchanged for a taciturn sullenness, much more convenient to me, and the rest of my lesson passed without interruption. This kind of intervention would, of course, not be acceptable um, nowadays, but it was back then. So also a, a window into the past. Um, Okay, a bell clanking out in the yard announced the moment for the cessation of school labors. I heard our own bell at the same time and that of a certain public college immediately after. Order dissolved instantly. Up started every pupil. I hastened to seize my hat, bow to the maitresse, and quit the room before the tide of externats should pour from the inner class, where I knew near a hundred were prisoned, and whose rising tumult I already heard. I had scarcely crossed the hall and gained the corridor when Mademoiselle Reuter came again upon me. Step in here a moment, said she, and she held open the door of the side room from whence she had issued on my arrival. It was a salle à manger, as appeared from the buffet and the armoire vitrée, filled with glass and china, which formed part of its furniture. Ere she had closed the door on me and herself, the corridor was already filled with day pupils, tearing down their cloaks, bonnets, and cabas from the wooden pegs on which they were suspended. The shrill voice of a maitresse was heard at intervals, vainly endeavoring to enforce some sort of order. Vainly, I say. Discipline there was none in these rough ranks, and yet this was considered one of the best conducted schools in Brussels. And here you see the criticism, right? Uh, it was supposed to be a disciplined, orderly place, but the students were out of control. Well, you have given your first lesson, began Mademoiselle Reuter in the most calm, equable voice, as though quite unconscious of the chaos from which we were separated only by a single wall. Were you satisfied with your pupils, or did any circumstance in their conduct give you cause for complaint? Conceal nothing from me, repose in me entire confidence. Happily, I felt in myself complete power to manage my pupils without aid. The enchantment, the golden haze which had dazzled my perspicuity at first, had been a good deal dissipated. I cannot say I was chagrined or downcast by the contrast which the reality of a pensionnat de demoiselle presented to my vague ideal of the same community. The contrast between ideal and reality is, um, you, you can see it throughout this novel, right? I was only enlightened and amused. Consequently, I felt in no disposition to complain to Mademoiselle Reuter, and I received her considerate invitation to confidence with a smile. A thousand thanks, mademoiselle. All has gone very smoothly. She looked more than doubtful. Et les trois demoiselles de première banque? said she. Ah, tout va mieux, was my answer, and mademoiselle Reuter ceased to question me. But her eye, not large, not brilliant, not melting or kindly, but astute, penetrating, practical, showed she was even with me. It let out a momentary gleam which said plainly, be as close as you like. I am not dependent on your candor. What you would conceal, I already know. By a transition so quiet as to be scarcely perceptible, the directress's manner changed. The anxious business air passed from her face, and she began chatting about the weather and the town and asking in neighborly wise after M Monsieur and Madame Pellet. I answered all her little questions. She prolonged her talk. I went on following its many little windings. She said so long, said so much, varied so often the topics of discourse, that it was not difficult to perceive she had a particular aim in thus detaining me. Her mere words could have afforded no clue to this aim, but her countenance aided. While her lips uttered only affable commonplaces, her eyes reverted continually to my face. 
Her glances were not given in full, but out of the corner, so quietly, so stealthily, yet I think I lost not one. I watched her as keenly as she watched me. I perceived soon that she was feeling after my real character. She was searching for salient points and weak. Points and eccentric points. She was applying now this test, now that, hoping in the end to find some chink, some niche, where she could put in her little firm foot and stand upon my neck. Mistress of my nature. Do not mistake me, reader. It was no amorous influence she wished to gain. At that time, it was only the power of a politician to which she aspired. I was now installed as a professor in her establishment, and she wanted to know where her mind was superior to mine, by what feeling or opinion she could lead me. So here we have a glance at the character of Mademoiselle Reuter. So she's a very practical woman. She wants to keep her business, and she likes to feel superior, and she knows she has the conscience that she's superior to all the other teachers, to the students, and now she wants to find a way in which she can be sure she is superior to William. And that's why she keeps him there for so long, um, just talking nonsense, but to be able to find the weak spot in uh, William. I enjoyed the game much and did not hasten its conclusion. Sometimes I gave her hopes, beginning a sentence rather weakly, when her shrewd eye would light up. She thought she had me. Having led her a little way, I delighted to turn round and finish with sound, hard sense, whereat her countenance would fall. At last, a servant entered to announce dinner. The conflict being thus necessarily terminated, we parted without having gained any advantage on either side. Mademoiselle Reuter had not even given me an opportunity of attacking her with feeling, and I had managed to baffle her little schemes of craft. So it's um, power dynamic game here also you see that William wants to feel superior to her so he feels like they're playing this game and uh, none of them none will win at least now I again held out my hand when I left the room she gave me hers it was a small and white hand but how cool I met her eye too in full obliging her to give me a straightforward look this last test went against me left her as it found her, moderate, temperate, tranquil, me, it disappointed. I am growing wiser, thought I, as I walked back to Monsieur Pellet's. Look at this little woman. Is she like the women of novelists and romancers? To read a female character as depicted in poetry and fiction, one would think it was made up of sentiment, either for good or bad. Here is a specimen, and a most sensible and respectable specimen too, whose staple ingredient is abstract reason. No Talleyrand was ever more passionless than Zoraide Reuter. So I thought then. I found afterwards that blunt susceptibilities are very consistent with strong propensities. Anticipating what will come next, right? Um, so you see that he doesn't have much knowledge of the world. Um, also, he doesn't have much knowledge of women in general. So what he knows from women of novelists and romance was that they were made of sentiment, either good or bad. But what he sees here in Mademoiselle Reuter is something completely different. It's not sentiment. It's reason, a very masculine trait, right? Um, and here he compares her to Talleyrand. I don't, uh, Talleyrand. Uh, he was uh, Napoleon's chief diplomat. So an example of crafty, cynical diplomacy. So she's compared to this politician. She is um, not a being of emotion or sentiment. She's a crafty woman with a business-like mindset and um, crafty diplomacy like a politician. So that's an interesting character, right, uh, Mademoiselle Reuter? And that is the beginning of chapter 10. So now let's take a look at chapter 11. I had indeed had a very long talk with a crafty little politician. That is, of course, uh, um, Mademoiselle Reuter's. And on regaining my quarters, I found the dinner was half over. 
To be late at meals was against the standing rule of the establishment, and had it been one of the Flemish ushers who thus entered after the removal of the soup and the commencement of the first course, Monsieur Pellet would probably have greeted him with a public rebuke and would certainly have mocked at him both of soup and fish. As it was, that polite, though partial gentleman only shook his head, and as I took my place, unrolled my napkin, and said my heretical grace to myself, he civilly dispatched a servant to the kitchen to bring me a plate of puree aux carottes, for this was a maigre day, and before sending away the first course, reserved for me a portion of stock fish of which it consisted. Dinner being over, the boys rushed out for their evening play. Kint and Van Damme, the two ushers, of course, followed them. Poor fellows, if they had not looked so very heavy, so very soulless, so very indifferent to all things in heaven above or in the earth beneath, I could have pitied them greatly for the obligation they were under to trail after those rough lads everywhere and at all times. Even as it was, I felt disposed to scout myself as a privileged prig when I turned to ascend to my chamber. Sure to find there, if not enjoyment, at least liberty. But this evening, as had often happened before, I was to be still farther distinguished. A bien mauvais sujet, said the voice of Monsieur Pelé behind me as I set my foot on the first step of the stair. Où allez-vous? Venez à la salle à manger, que je vous gronde un peu. I beg pardon, Monsieur said I as I followed him to his private sitting room. For having returned so late, it was not my fault. This is just what I want to know, rejoined Monsieur Pellet, as he ushered me into the comfortable parlour with a good wood fire, for the stove had now been removed for the season. Having rung the bell, he ordered coffee for two, and presently he and I were seated, almost in English comfort. Almost in English comfort is quite fine. <laughs> One on each side of the hearth, a little round table between us with a coffee pot, a sugar basin, and two large white china cups. While Monsieur Pellet employed himself in choosing a cigar from a box, my thoughts reverted to the two outcast ushers whose voices I could hear even now crying hoarselessly, hoarsely for order in the playground. C'est une grande responsabilité que la surveillance, observed I. Platine? Did uh, Monsieur Pellet. I remarked that I thought Messieurs Vendon and Kint must sometimes be a little fatigued with their labors. The bet de somme, the bet de somme, murmured scornfully the director. Meantime, I offered him his cup of coffee. You see how the ushers, uh, because they are less educated and they are uh, Flemish, they are treated as inferiors by uh, Monsieur Pellet. Servez-vous, mon garçon, said he blandly, when I had put a couple of huge lumps of continental sugar into his cup. And now tell me why you stayed so long at Mademoiselle Reuters. I know that lessons conclude in her establishment as in mine at four o'clock, and when you turned, and when you returned, it was past five. Mademoiselle wished to speak with me, monsieur. Indeed. On what subject, if one may ask? But Moselle talked about nothing, monsieur. A fertile topic. And did she discourse thereon in the schoolroom before the pupils? No. Like you, monsieur, she asked me to walk into her parlor. And Madame Reuter, the old duenna, my mother's gossip, was there, of course? No, monsieur. I had the honor of being quite alone with mademoiselle. C'est joli, cela observed Monsieur Pellet, and he smiled and looked into the fire. Oh, ni soit qui mal y pense, ni soit qui mal y pense, murmured I significantly, which is kind of um, shame be it on those who think it. So nothing happened between the two of them. And if uh, Monsieur is trying to imply that something happened because of the uh, amount of time that he spent there. It is his own shame to think of something that was not true. Je connais un peu ma petite voisine, voyez-vous. In that case, monsieur will be able to aid me in finding out what was mademoiselle's reason for making me sit before her sofa one mortal hour, 
listening to the most copious and fluent dissertation on the merest frivolities. She was sounding your character. I thought so, monsieur. Did she find out your weak point? What is my weak point? Why, the sentimental. Any woman sinking her shaft deep enough will at least reach a fathomless spring of sensibility in thy breast, Crimsworth. And he has nailed it. Remember what we've read so far, how he romanticizes uh, life and his reality, how he um, um, likes to be, remember, uh, connect with um, nature, romanticizing nature, sublime, ex sublime experiencing, so pay attention to the moonlight, to the picturesqueness of nature. And Monsieur Pellet realizes that he is a sentimental man. I felt the blood stir about my heart and rise warm to my cheek. Some women might, monsieur. Is Mademoiselle writer of the number? Come, speak frankly, mon fils. Elle est encore jeune, plus âgée que toi peut-être, mais juste assez pour unir la tendresse d'une petite maman à l'amour d'une épouse dévouée. N'est-ce pas que cela tirait supérieurement no, monsieur, I should like my wife to be my wife and not have my mother. She is then a little too old for you? No, monsieur, not a day too old if she suited me in other things. In what does she not suit you, William? She is personally agreeable, is she not? Very. Her hair and complexion are just what I admire, and her turn of form, though quite Belgium, is full of grace. Though quite Belgium. So again, he puts the Belgium, um, in this case, the Belgium ideal as, as lower, as inferior to the English ideal. Bravo. And her face, her features. How do you like them? A little harsh, especially her mouth. Oh, yes, her mouth, said Monsieur Pellet. He chuckled inwardly. There is character about her mouth, firmness. But she has a very pleasant smile, don't you think so? Rather crafty. True. But that expression of craft is owing to her eyebrows. Have you remarked her eyebrows? I answered that I had not. You have not seen her looking down then, said he. No. It is a treat, notwithstanding. Observe her when she has some knitting or some other woman's work in hand and sits the image of peace, calmly intent on her needles and her silk, some discussion meantime going on around her, in the course of which peculiarities of characters are being developed or important interests canvassed. She takes no part in it. Her humble feminine mind is wholly with her knitting. None of her features move. She neither presumes to smile approval nor frown disapprobation. Her little hands assiduously ply their unpretending task. If she can only get this purse finished or this bonnet gris completed, it is enough for her. If gentlemen approach her chair, a deeper quiescence, a meeker modesty settles on her features and clothes her general meal. Observe then her eyebrows. Et dites-moi s'il n'y a pas du chat dans l'un et du renard dans l'autre. I will take careful notice the first opportunity, said I. And then, continued Monsieur Pelleux, the eyelid will flicker. The light-colored lashes be lifted a second, and a blue eye, glancing out from under the screen, will take its brief, sly, searching survey and retreat again. I smiled, and so did Pelé, and after a few minutes' silence, I asked, Will she ever marry, do you think? Marry? Will birds pair? Of course it is both her intention and resolution to marry when she finds a suitable match, and no one is better aware than herself of the sort of impression she is capable of producing. No one likes better to captivate in a quiet way. I am mistaken if she will not yet leave the print of her stealing steps on thy heart, Crimsworth. Of her steps? Confound it, no. My heart is not a plank to be walked on. But the soft touch of a pâte de velours will do it no harm. Pâte de velours, um, de velours, uh, velvet paw. A velvet paw will make no harm on that wooden plate. She offers me no pâte de velours. She is all form and reserved in reserve with me. That to begin with, let respect be the foundation. 
affection the first floor, love the superstructure. Mademoiselle Reuter is a skillful architect. An interest, Monsieur Pellet, interest. Will not Mademoiselle consider that point? Yes, yes, no doubt. It will be the cement between every stone. And now we have discussed the directress. What of the pupils? N'y a-t-il pas de belles études parmi ces jeunes têtes? Studies of character. Yes, curious ones, at least, I imagine, but one cannot divine much from a first interview. Ah, you affect discretion. But tell me now, were you not a little abashed before these blooming young creatures? At first, yes, but I rallied and got through with all due sang-froid, cold blood. I don't believe you. It is true, notwithstanding. At first, I thought them angels, but they did not leave me long under that delusion. Three of the eldest and handsomest undertook the task of setting me right, and they managed so cleverly that in five minutes I knew them, at least for what they were. Three errant coquettes. Je les connais, exclaimed Monsieur Pellet. Elles sont toujours au premier rang à l'église et à la promenade. Une blonde superbe, une jolie espiègle, une belle brune. Exactly. Lovely creatures, all of them. Heads for artists. What a group they would make taken together. Ulali, I know their names, with her smooth braided hair and calm ivory brow. Hortense, with her rich chestnut locks so luxuriantly knotted, plaited, twisted, as if she did not know how to dispose of all their abundance. With her vermilion lips, damask cheek, and roguish laughing eye. And Caroline de Blémont, oh, there is beauty, beauty in perfection. What a cloud of sable curls about the face of a Uri. What fascinating lips, what glorious black eyes. Your Byron would have worshipped her and you, you cold, frigid islander. You played the austere, the insensible in the presence of an Aphrodite so exquisite. I might have laughed at the director's enthusiasm had I believed it real, but there was something in his tone which indicated got up raptures. I felt he was only affecting fervor in order to put me off my guard, to induce me to come out in return, so I scarcely even smiled. He went on. Confess, William, do not the mere good looks of Zoraide Reuter appear dowdish and commonplace compared with the splendid charms of some of her pupils? The question discomposed me, but I now felt plainly that my principal was endeavoring, for reasons best known to himself, at that time I could not fathom them, to excite ideas and wishes in my mind alien to what was right and honorable. The iniquity of the instigation proved its antidote, and when he further added, each of those three beautiful girls we have a handsome fortune, and with a little address, a gentleman-like, intelligent young fellow like you might make himself master of the hand, heart, and purse of any one of the trio. I replied by a look and an interrogative. Monsieur, which startled him. He laughed a forced laugh, affirmed that he had only been joking, and demanded whether I could possibly have thought him in earnest. Just then the bell rang. The play hour was over. It was an evening on which Monsieur Pellet was accustomed to read passages from the drama and the belles lettres to his pupils. He did not wait for my answer, but rising, left the room, humming as he went some gay strain of Berengère's. And that's the end of chapter 11. So we get to know the inside of the Belgium classroom, 19th century Belgium classroom. And those three girls who are the queens of the classroom, how each of them is described, not physically, but also intellectually, um, emotionally. And it's clear that William finds himself superior. He was um, quite not afraid, but hesitant and perhaps a bit embarrassed uh, before he first met them because he had thought, idealized these girls as angels. But when he comes, um, he faces reality, he sees that they are not angels. They are just ordinary students making a mess, creating chaos. And he has the nerve to be, he has the sang-froid, cold blood to um, uh, manage them. And so he does. So the, the contrast between the real and ideal is uh, pervasive in the novel, and it continues here in chapter 12. 12. 
Daily, as I continued my attendance at the seminary of Mademoiselle Reuter, did I find fresh occasions to compare the idea with the real. What had I known of female character previously to my arrival at Brussels? Precious little. And what was my notion of it? Something vague, slight, gauzy, glittering. Now, when I came in contact with it, I found it to be a popple substance enough, very hard to sometimes and often heavy. There was metal in it, both lead and iron. Let the idealists, the dreamers about earthly angel and human flowers, just look here while I open my portfolio and show them a sketch or two penciled after nature. I took these sketches in the second-class schoolroom of Mademoiselle Reuter's establishment, where about a hundred specimens of the genus Jeune Fille collected together, offered a fertile variety of subjects. So now it feels like he's studying them as if they were, um, I don't know, particles under a microscope, right? He calls them subjects and ca uh, catalogs them as specimens of the genus Jeune Fille. Um, let the dreamers dream, let the idealists idealize. There's no such thing as um, perfect angel-like uh, girls. I'm going to give you some examples. True to nature, and that is meaning true to reality. A miscellaneous assortment they were, differing both in case and country, as I sat on my estrade and glanced over the long range of desks, I had under my eye French, English, Belgians, Austrians, and Prussians. The majority belonged to the class bourgeois. But there were many countesses. There were the daughters of two generals and of several colonels, captains, and government employees. These ladies sat side by side with young females destined to be demoiselles de magasin, and with some flamand, genuine aborigines of the country. So a very different mix. So those that had quite, um, they came from a bourgeois class. So um, people that had families that had made money and uh, perhaps with trade, business. Um, so they were affluent in that way. But there were also some from the old aristocracy, countesses, or also from other areas of prestige, like daughters of generals, colonels, captains, government employees. And these, let's say, ladies from a higher status were sitting side by side with young females destined to be demoiselles de magasin, girls of shops, right? So those that would end up having to work at, uh, um, at a store to provide for themselves, right? These were called demoiselles de magasin, the working class. In dress, all were nearly similar, and in manners, there was small difference. Exceptions there were to the general rule, but the majority gave the tone to the establishment, and that tone was rough, boisterous and masked by a point-blank disregard of all forbearance towards each other or their teachers. An eager pursuit by each individual of her own interest and convenience, and a coarse indifference to the interest and convenience of everyone else. So even the supposedly well-bred girls, the ones who were supposed to have good manners, good education, even those are... Um, are, how do they call, how does he call them? Boisterous, rough, masked by a point blank disregard of all forbearance towards each other or their teachers. Mm. Most of them could lie with audacity when it appeared advantageous to do so. All understood the art of speaking fair when a point was to be gained, and could with consummate skill and at a moment's notice turn the cold shoulder the instant civility ceased to be turn the cold shoulder the instant civility ceased to be profitable. They were very crafty, these girls. Very little open quarreling ever took place amongst them, but backbiting and tail bearing were universal. Close friendships were forbidden by the rules of the school, and no one girl seemed to cultivate more regard for another than was just necessary to secure a companion when solitude would have been irksome. They were each and all supposed to have been reared in utter unconsciousness of vice. The precautions used to keep them ignorant, if not innocent, were innumerable. 
How was it then that scarcely one of those girls having attained the age of 14 could look a man in the face with modesty and propriety? An air of bold, impudent flirtation or a loose, silly leer was sure to answer the most ordinary glance from a masculine eye. Look how he judges them like they were... Um, insinuating girls, right, who would do things in case it was to their advantage. So they would lie, they would um, be extra civil if it was to their advantage, um, and they had no modesty and propriety. That's how he describes the girls there. I know nothing of the arcana of the Roman Catholic religion, and I am not a bigot in matters of theology, but I suspect the root of this precocious impurity, so obvious, so general in popish countries, popish meaning from the Pope, so Catholic countries, is to be found in the discipline, if not the doctrines of the Church of Rome. And now the English Protestant man, he places, he pinpoints the origin of vice in these girls in the doctrines of the Church of Rome. So look at that. I record what I have seen. These girls belonged to what are called the respectable ranks of society. They had all been carefully brought up, yet was the mass of them mentally depraved. So much for the general view. Now for one or two selected specimens. And now he's going to discuss specific examples of the students that corroborate his idea of this vicious set of girls. The first picture is a full length of Aurelia Coslow, a German Fräulein, or rather a half-breed between German and Russian. She's 18 years of age and has been sent to Brussels to finish her education. She's of middle size, stiffly made, body long, legs short, bust much developed but not compactly molded, waist disproportionately compressed by an inhumanly braced corset. Dress carefully arranged, large feet tortured into small boutines, head small, hair smothered, smooth, smoothed, braided, oiled, and gummed to perfection. Very low forehead, very diminutive and vindictive gray eyes, somewhat tartar features, rather flat nose, rather high cheekbones, yet the ensemble not positively ugly, tolerably good complexion. So much for person physically. As to mind, deplorably ignorant and ill-informed, incapable of writing or speaking correctly even German, her native language, her native tongue, a dunce in French and her attempts at learning English a mere farce. Yet she has been at school 12 years, but as she invariably gets her exercises of every description done by a fellow pupil and reads her lessons off a book, Concealed in her lap, it is not wonderful that her progress has been so snail-like. I do not know what Aurelia's daily habits of life are, because I have not the opportunity of observing her, her at all times. But from what I see of the state of her desk, books and papers, I should say she's slovenly and even dirty. Her outward dress, as I have said, is well attended to. But in passing behind her bench, I have remarked that her neck is grey for want of washing, and her hair, so glossy with gum and grease, is not such as one feels tempted to pass the hand over, much less to run the fingers through. Aurelia's conduct in class, at least when I am present, is something extraordinary, considered as an index of girlish innocence. The moment I enter the room, she nudges her next neighbor and indulges in a half-suppressed laugh. As I take my seat on the strade, she fixes her eye on me. She seems resolved to attract and, if possible, monopolize my notice. To this end, she launches at me all sorts of looks, languishing, provoking, leering, laughing. As I am found quite proof against this sort of artillery, for we scorn what unasked is lavishly offered. She has recourse to the expedient of making noises. Sometimes she sighs, sometimes groans, sometimes utters, inarticulate sounds, for which language has no name. If in walking up the schoolroom I pass near her, she puts out her foot that it may touch mine. If I do not happen to observe the manoeuvre and my boot comes in contact with her 
hors de camp, she affects to fall into convulsions of suppressed laughter. If I notice the snare and avoid it, she expresses her mortification in sullen muttering, where I hear myself abused in bad French, pronounced with an intolerable low German accent. So that's one example. Not far from Mademoiselle Coslo sits another young lady by name Adèle Dronsard. This is a Belgian, rather low of stature, in form heavy, with broad waist, short neck and limbs, good red and white complexion, features well chiseled and regular, well cut eyes of a clear brown color, light brown hair, good teeth, aged not, not much above 15, but as full grown as a stout young English woman of 20. This portrait gives the idea of a somewhat dumpy but good-looking damsel, does it not? Well, when I looked along the row of young heads, my eye generally stopped at this of Adele's. Her gaze was ever waiting for mine, and it frequently succeeded in arresting it. She was an unnatural-looking being, so young, fresh, bloomy, yet so gorgon-like. And here Gorgon Charlotte Bronte makes a reference to one of the three snake-haired sisters in Greek mythology that turned the beholder into stone, the most famous being uh, Medusa. So it's also used as a synonym, synonym for ugly. So she looked fresh, young, boomy. Yes, yeah, she was Gorgon-like. Suspicion, sullen ill temper were on her forehead, vicious propensities in her eye, envy and panther-like deceit about her mouth. In general, she sat very still. Her massive shape looked as if it could not bend much, nor did her large head, so broad at the base, so narrow towards the top, seem made to turn readily on her short neck. She had but two varieties of expression. The prevalent one, a forbidding, dissatisfied scowl, varied sometimes by a most pernicious and perfidious smile. She was shunned by her fellow pupils, for bad as many of them were, few were as bad as she. Another example of a terrible uh, lady, right? Looks all pretty and all, but mentally, intellectually, and in terms of matters, nothing. Aurelia and Adele were in the first division of the second class the second division was headed by a pensionnaire named Joanna Trista. That's another lady. The girl, This girl was of mixed Belgian and Spanish origin. Her Flemish mother was dead. Her Catalonian father was a merchant residing in the Isles, where Joanna had been born and whence she was sent to Europe to be educated. I wonder that anyone looking at that girl's head and countenance would have received her under their roof. She had precisely the same shape of skull as Pope Alexander VI. Her organs of benevolence, veneration, conscientiousness, adhesiveness were singularly small. Those of self-esteem, firmness, destructiveness, combativeness, preposterously large. So he only, he only emphasizes the bad characteristics of this girl. So. Her head sloped up in the penthouse shape, was contracted about the forehead and prominent behind. She had rather good, though large and marked features. Her temperament was fibrous and bilious, her complexion pale and dark, hair and eyes black from angular and rigid but proportionate age 15. Joanna was not very thin, but she had a gaunt visage and her regard was fierce and hungry. Narrow as was her brow, it presented space enough for the legible craving, graving of two words, mutiny and hate. In some one of her other lineaments, I think the eye, cowardice, had also its distinct cipher. It feels like his, like William as a character is so, um, I don't know, mad at the world. Right? He sees only bad things about these people, but when he sees nature, he romanticizes life. It is so different, like completely different people, but it's the same, same person. Mademoiselle Trista thought fit to trouble my first lessons with a coarse workday sort of turbulence. She made noises with her mouth like a horse. 
She ejected her saliva. She uttered brutal expressions. Behind and below her were seated a band of very vulgar, inferior-looking flam flamande, including two or three examples of that deformity of person and imbecility of intellect whose frequency in the low countries would seem to furnish proof that the climate is such as to induce degeneracy of the human mind and body. Yeah, what is this about? So again, prejudice, right, against the low countries. And I would say that the, the root of this prejudice lies in the religion. Uh, the low countries, um, at least Belgium, um, was Catholic, right? And England was Protestant. So there was this, um, how can I say, <laughs> this suspicion of everything related to the Church of Rome, as they call it, because they associated the Church of Rome with uh, promiscuity, with uh, excess, with uh, vice, uh, which is, of course, an exaggeration. Um, but that's the root of the break with the Catholic Church that led to the, to the rise of Protestantism. And even in the 19th century, that still felt, and especially here in his discourse, we see that um, um, we see this anti-Catholic discourse throughout his speech. These, I soon found, were completely under her influence, and with their aid she got up and sustained a swinish tumult, which I was constrained at last to quell by ordering her and two of her tools to rise from their seats, and having kept them standing five minutes, turning them bodily out of the schoolroom, the accomplices into a large place adjoining called the Grande Salle, the principal into a cabinet of which I closed the door and pocketed the key. Think of this punishment. This judgment I executed in the presence of Mademoiselle Reuter, who looked much aghast at beholding so decided a proceeding, the most severe that had ever been ventured on in her establishment. Her look of affright I answered with one of composure, and finally with a smile, which perhaps flattered and certainly soothed her. Duana Trista remained in Europe long enough to repay, by malevolence and ingratitude, all who had ever done her a good turn. And she then went to join her father in the Isles, exulting in the thought that she should there have slaves, whom, as she said, she could kick and strike at will. These three pictures are from the life. These examples of terrible ladies. These are pictures from his life. I possess others as marked and as little agreeable, but I will spare my reader the exhibition of them. Doubtless it will be thought that I ought now, by way of contrast, to show something charming, some gentle virgin head, circled with a halo, some sweet personification of innocence, clasping the dove of peace to her bosom. No, I saw nothing of the sort, and therefore cannot portray it. The pupil in the school possessing the happiest disposition was a young girl from the, from the country, Louise Path. She was sufficiently benevolent and obliging, but not well taught nor well mannered. Moreover, the plague spot of dissimulation was in her also. Honor and principle were unknown to her. She had scarcely heard their names, the names of um, principle and honor. The least exceptionable pupil was the poor little Sylvie I have mentioned once before. Sylvie was gentle in manners, intelligent in mind. She was even sincere as far as her religion would permit her to be so, but her physical organization was defective. Sincere as long as, as far as her religion would permit her to be so, because she was a Catholic. Ah, weak health stunted her growth and chilled her spirits. And then, destined as she was for the cloister, her whole soul was warped to a conventual bias, and in the tame, trained subjection of her manner, one read that she had already prepared herself for her future course of life by giving up her independence of thought and action into the hands of some despotic confessor. She permitted herself no original opinion, no preference of companion or employment. In everything, she was guided by another. With a pale, passive, automaton air, she went about all day long doing what she was bid, 
never what she liked or what from innate conviction she thought it right to do. The poor little future, the poor little future religieuse had been early taught to make the dictates of her own reason and conscience quite subordinate to the will of her spiritual director. She was the model pupil of Mademoiselle Reuter's establishment, pale blighted image where life lingered feebly, but whence the soul had been conjured by Romish wizardcraft. The soul of Sylvie had been conjured by Romish, meaning Roman Catholic wizardry, wizardcraft, had crushed her, left her as someone without original opinion, uh, no independence of thought or action, just a submissive being who was uh, preparing to live in a cloister and to be um, in to the hands of some despotic confessor. So that's a very prejudiced view of the Catholic Church, right, and of the people that followed the religion. Okay, a few English pupils there were in this school, and this might be divided into two classes. First, the continental English, the daughters chiefly of broken adventurers whom debt or dishonor had driven from their own country. These poor girls had never known the advantages of settled homes, decorous example, or honest Protestant education. Resident a few months now in one Catholic school, now in another, as their parents wandered from land to land, from France to Germany, from Germany to Belgium, they had picked up some scanty instruction, many bad habits, losing every notion even of the first elements of religion and morals, and acquiring an imbecile indifference to every sentiment that can elevate humanity. They were distinguishable by an habitual look of sullen dejection, the result of crushed self-respect and constant bro browbeating from their popish fellow pupils, popish, like Catholic, who hated them as English and scorned them as heretics. The second class were British English. Of this, I did not encounter half a dozen during the whole time of my attendance at the seminary. Their characteristics were clean but careless dress, ill-arranged hair compared with the tight and trim foreigners. Erect carriage, flexible figures, white and taper hands, features more irregular, but also more intellectual than those of the Belgians, grave and modest countenances, a general air of native propriety and decency. You see, other types of characteristics were, um, were favored here. So the ones that are associated with Protestantism, that William associated with Protestantism grave, modest, propriety, decency. By this last circumstance alone, I could at glance distinguish the daughter of Albion. Albion is a literary term for England or Britain. So a daughter of Albion is an English girl and nursling of Protestantism from the foster child of Rome, the protégé of Jesuitry. Proud too was the aspect of these British girls, at once envied and ridiculed by their continental associates, they warded off insult with austere civility and met hate with mute disdain. They eschewed company keeping and in the midst of numbers seemed to dwell isolated. So this is an overview of the types of students that he encountered. And now he's going to talk about the teachers. The teachers presiding over this mixed multitude were three in number, all French. Their names, Mademoiselles Zephyrine, Pelagie, and Suzette. The two last were commonplace personages enough. Their look was ordinary, their manner was ordinary, their temper was ordinary, their thoughts, feelings, and views were all ordinary. Were I to write a chapter on the subject, I could not elucidate it further. Zephyrine was somewhat more distinguished in appearance and deportment than Pelagie and Suzette, but in character genuine Parisian, coquette, perfidious, mercenary, and dry-hearted. Um, stereotypical associations with the uh, Parisians. A fourth maîtresse I sometimes saw who seemed to come daily to teach needlework or netting or lace mending or some such flimsy art, but of her I never had more than a passing glimpse as she sat in the carré with her frames and some dozen of the elder pupils around her. Consequently, I had no opportunity of studying her character or even of observing her person much. 
The latter, I remarked, had a very English air for a maîtresse. Otherwise, it was not striking. Of, the only striking thing about her was that she looked a bit English. She had a bit of an English air. Um, of character, I should think, she possessed but little, as her pupils seemed constantly en revolt against her authority. She did not reside in the house. Her name, I think, was Mademoiselle Henri. Amidst this assemblage of all that was insignificant and defective, much that was vicious and repulsive, look at the use of ad ad adjectives, insignificant, defective, vicious, repulsive. By the last epithet, many would have described the two or three stiff, silent, distantly behaved, ill-dressed British girls. The sensible, sagacious, affable directress shone like a steady star over a marsh full of jack-o'-lanterns. Profoundly aware of her superiority, she derived an inward bliss from that consciousness, which sustained her under all the care and responsibility inseparable from her position. It kept her temper calm, her brow smooth, her manner tranquil. She liked, as who would not, on entering the schoolroom to feel that her sole presence sufficed to diffuse that order and quiet which all the remonstrances and even commands of her underlings frequently failed to enforce. She liked to stand in comparison, or rather contrast, with those who surrounded her, and to know that in personal as well as mental advantages she bore away the undisputed palm of preference. The three teachers were all playing. And here, amidst all this savagery, Plainless, plainness shown the directress, Zoraide uh, Reuter. Her pupils she managed with such indulgence and address, taking you always on herself the office of recompenser and eulogist, and abandoning to her subalterns every invidious task of blame and punishment, that they all regarded her with deference, if not with affection. Her teachers did not love her, but they submitted because they were her inferiors in everything. The various masters who attended her school were each and all in some way or other under her influence. Over one, she had acquired power by her skillful management of his bad temper. Over another, by little attentions to his petty caprices. A third, she had subdued by flattery. A fourth, a timid man, she kept in awe by a sort of austere decision of Mia. Me, she still watched, still tried by the most ingenious tests. She roved around me, baffled, yet persevering. I believe she thought I was like a smooth and bare precipice, which offered neither jutting stone, nor tree root, nor tuft of grass to aid the climber. Now she flattered with exquisite tact, now she moralized, now she tried how far I was accessible to mercenary motives. Then she disported on the brink of affection, knowing that some men are won by weakness. Anon she talked excellent sense, aware that some that others have the folly to admire judgment. I found it at once pleasant and easy to evade all these efforts. It was sweet when she thought me nearly worn to turn around and to smile in her very eyes, half scornfully, and then to witness her scarcely veiled, though mute mortif mortification. Still she persevered, and at last, I am bound to confess it, her finger, essaying proving every atom of the casket, touched its secret spring, and for a moment the lid sprang open. She laid her hand on the jewel within. Whether she stole and broke it, or whether the lid shut again with a snap of her fingers, read on and you shall know. Addressing the reader directly, right? Read on and you will know what she did to me. It happened that I came one day to give a lesson when I was indisposed. I had a bad cold and a cough. Two hours incessant talking left me very hoarse and tired, and I quitted the schoolroom and was passing along the corridor. I met Mademoiselle Reuter. She remarked with an anxious air that I looked very pale and tired. Yes, I said, I was fatigued. And then, with increased interest, she rejoined, You shall not go away till you have had some refreshment. She persuaded me to step into the parlor and was very kind and gentle while I, while I stayed. The next day she was kinder still. She came herself into the class to see that the windows were closed and that there was no draught. She exhorted me with friendly earnestness not to overexert myself 
When I went away, she gave me her hand unasked, and I could not but mark by a respectful and gentle pressure that I was sensible of the favor and grateful for it. My modest demonstration kindled a little merry smile on her countenance. I thought her almost charming. During the remainder of the evening, my mind was full of impatience for the afternoon of the next day to arrive, that I might see her again. So finally she found a way to um, identify his weak point and to get to him. And that was by um, caring for him, right? Showing affection. I was not disappointed, for she sat in the class during the whole of my subsequent lesson and often looked at me almost with affection. At four o'clock, she accompanied me out of the schoolroom, asking with solicitude after my health, then scolding me sweetly because I spoke too loud and gave myself too much trouble. I stopped at the glass door, which led into the garden, in the garden, to hear her lecture to the end. The door was open. It was a very fine day, and while I listened to the soothing reprimand, I looked at the sunshine and flowers and felt very happy. The day scholars began to pour from the school rooms into the passage. Will you go into the garden a minute or two? asked she, till they are gone. I descended the steps without answering, but I looked back as much as to say, you will come with me. In another minute, I and the directress were walking side by side down the alley bordered with fruit trees, whose white blossoms were then in full blow as well as their tender green leaves. The sky was blue, the air still. The May afternoon was full of brightness and fragrance. Released from the stifling class, surrounded with flowers and foliage, with a pleasing, smiling, affable woman at my side, how did I feel? Why, very enviably. It seemed as if the romantic visions my imagination had suggested of this garden, while it was yet hidden from me by the jealous boards, were more than realized. Pay attention to the words, the romantic visions of my imagination. Remember how he had created this paradise, this garden of Eden, on the other side of that closed window. Now he's finally there, and being there with this woman on this beautiful May day, um with the flowers and the blue sky and the nice fragrance and brightness of air. It was as if that romantic imagination had been realized. And when a turn in the alley shut out the view of the house and some tall shrubs excluded Monsieur Pelé's mansion and screened us momentarily from the other houses. So they were for a moment just inside a bubble, the two of them without any connection with the outside world. Um, rising amphitheater-like round this green spot, I gave my arm to Mademoiselle Reuter and led her to a garden chair nestled under some lilacs near. She sat down. I took my place at her side. She went on talking to me with that ease which communicates ease. And as I listened, a revelation dawned in my mind that I was on the brink of falling in love. The dinner bell rang both at her house and Monsieur Pellet's. We were obliged to part. I detained her a moment as she was moving away. I want something, said I. What? asked Zoraide naively. Only a flower. Gather it then, or two, or twenty, if you like. No, one will do, but you must gather it and give it to me. What a caprice, she exclaimed. But she raised herself on her tiptoes and, plucking a beautiful branch of lilac, offered it to me with grace. I took it and went away, satisfied for the present and hopeful for the future. Certainly that May day was a lovely one, and it closed in moonlight night of summer warmth and serenity. I remember this well, for having set up late that evening, correcting devoirs and feeling weary and a little oppressed with the closeness of my small room, I opened the often-mentioned boarded window, whose boards, however, I had persuaded old Madame Pellet to have removed, since I had filled the post of professor in the Pensionnat de Demoiselles, as from that time it was no longer inconvenient for me to overlook my own pupils at their sports. So the, the window was finally open, and whenever he felt like closed, oppressed, claustrophobic in that small room, he looked outside this garden, right? window to hopefulness. 
I sat down in the window seat, rested my arm on the sill, and leaned out. Above me was the clear obscure of a cloudless night sky. Splendid moonlight subdued the tremulous sparkle of the stars. Below lay the garden, varied with silvery luster and deep shade, and all fresh with dew. A grateful perfume exhaled from the closed blossoms of the fruit trees. Not a leaf stirred. The night was breezeless. Again, romanticizing the nature there, right? My window looked directly down upon a certain walk of Mademoiselle Reuter's garden called L'Allée Défendue, so named because the pupils were forbidden to enter it on account of its proximity to the boys' school. It was here that the lilacs and laburnums grew specially thick. This was the most sheltered nook in the enclosure. It shrubs screened the garden chair where the that afternoon I had sat with the young directress. I need not say that my thoughts were chiefly with her as I leaned from the lattice and let my eye roam, now over the walks and borders of the garden, now along the many-windowed front of the house which rose wide beyond the masses of foliage. I wondered in what part of the building was situated her apartment, and a single light shining through the persienne of one croisé seemed to direct me to it. So he's romanticizing that she's there where he sees the light in a room and that she's there almost midnight thinking, staying up late. She watches late, thought I, for it must be now near midnight. She's a fascinating little woman. I continued in voiceless soliloquy. Her image forms a pleasant picture in memory. I know she's not what the world calls pretty. No matter, there is harmony in her aspect and I like it. Her brown hair, her blue eye, the freshness of her cheek, the whiteness of her neck, all suit my taste. Then I respect her talent. The idea of marrying a doll or a fool was always abhorrent to me. I know that a pretty doll, a fair fool, might do well enough for the honeymoon, but when passion cooled, how dreadful to find a lump of wax and wood laid in my bosom, a half-idiot clasped in my arms, and to remember that I had made of this my equal. Nay, my idol, to know that I must pass the rest of my dreary life with a creature incapable of understanding what I said, of appreciating what I thought, or of sympathizing with what I felt. So he's being very adamant here. Um, he doesn't want a wife just as a trophy, someone who's pretty, um, uh, a fool, a doll, right? He wants someone with substance, with intellect, with talent like um, Mademoiselle Reuter. Now, Zoraide Reuter, thought I, has tact, caractère, judgment, discretion. Has she heart? What a good simple little smile played about her lips when she gave me the branch of lilacs. I have thought her crafty, dissembling, interested sometimes, it is true, but may not much that looks like cunning and dissimulation in her conduct be only the efforts made by a bland temper to traverse quietly perplexing difficulties? And as to interest, she wishes to make her way in the world, no doubt, and who can blame her? Even if she be truly deficient in sound principle, is it not rather her misfortune than her fault? She has been brought up a Catholic, had she been born an Englishwoman and reared a Protestant, might she not have added straight integrity to all her other excellences? So if only she had been born Protestant, reared Protestant, then she would have been the perfect lady. That's uh, <laughs> um, the fact that she was reared as a Catholic um, may have ruined some of her principles, but still she's a very good match. Supposing she were to marry an English and Protestant husband, would she not, rational, sensible as she is, quickly acknowledge the superiority of right over expediency, honesty over policy? It would be worth a man's while to try the experiment. Tomorrow I will renew my observations. She knows that I watch her, how calm she is under scrutiny. It seems rather to gratify than annoy her. Here a strain of music stole in upon my monologue and suspended it. It was a bugle very skillfully played in the neighborhood of the park, I thought, or on the Place Royale. A bugle is a sort of a small trumpet. 
So sweet were the tones, so subduing their effect at that hour in the midst of silence and under the quiet rain of moonlight. Romanticizing. I ceased to think that I might I ceased to think that I might listen more intently. The strain retreated, its sound waxed fainter and was soon gone. My ear prepared to repose on the absolute hush of midnight once more. No. What murmur was that which, low and yet near and approaching nearer, frustrated the expectation of total silence? It was someone conversing. Yes, evidently an audible, though subdued voice, spoke in the garden immediately below me. Another answered. The first voice was that of a man, the second that of a woman. And a man and a woman I saw coming slowly down the alley. Their forms were at first in shade. I could but discern a dusk outline of each, but a ray of moonlight met them at the termination of the walk when they were under my very nose and revealed very plainly, very unequivocally, Mademoiselle Zoraide Reuter, arm in arm or hand in hand, I forget which, because he's an older William looking back, so some of the details he cannot really remember. But he saw her arm in arm, or hand in hand, with my principal, confidant and counselor, Monsieur François Pellet. And Monsieur Pellet was saying, À quand donc le jour de noce, ma, ma bien-aimée, the, ma bien the nuptials night, when? And Mademoiselle Reuter answered, Mais François, tu sais bien qu'il me serait impossible de me marier avant les vacances. She said that it would be possible for her to marry before the vacation. July, June, I mean June, July, August, a whole quarter, exclaimed the director. How can I wait so long? I who am ready even now to expire at your feet with impatience. Oh, well, if you die, the whole affair will be settled without any trouble about notaries and contracts. I shall only have to order a slight mourning dress, which will be much sooner prepared than the nuptial trousseau. Cruel Zoraide, you laugh at the distress of one who loves you so devotedly as I do. My torment is your sport. You scruple not to stretch my soul on the wreck of jealousy. For deny it as you will, I am certain you have cast encouraging glances on that schoolboy, Crimsworth. He has presumed to fall in love which he dared not have done unless you had given him room to hope. What do you say, François? Do you say Crimsworth is in love with me? Over head and ears. Has he told you so? No, but I see it in his face. He blushes whenever your name is mentioned. A little laugh of exulting coquetry announced Mademoiselle Reuter's gratification at this piece of intelligence, which was a lie, by the by. I had never been so far gone as that, after all. Monsieur Pelé proceeded to ask what she intended to do with me, intimating pretty plainly and not very gallantly that it was nonsense for her to think of taking such a blown back as a husband, remember the, the white beak, since she must be at least 10 years older than I. Was she then 32? I should not have thought so. I heard her disclaim any intentions on the subject. The director, however, still pressed her to give a definite answer. François, said she, you were jealous. And still she laughed. Then, as if suddenly recollecting that this coquetry was not consistent with the character for modest dignity she wished to establish, she proceeded in a demure voice. Truly, my dear François, I will not deny that this young Englishman may have made some attempts to ingratiate himself with me. But so far from giving him any encouragement, I have always treated him with as much reserve as it was possible to combine with civility. Affianced as I am to you, I would give no man false hopes, believe me, dear friend. Still Pelé uttered murmurs of distrust. So I judged, at least from her reply. What folly! How could I prefer an unknown foreigner to you? And then, not to flatter your vanity, Crimsworth could not bear comparison with you either physically or mentally. He is not a handsome man at all. Some may call him gentleman-like and intelligent-looking, but for my part... The rest of the sentence was lost in the distance, as the pair, rising from the chair in which they had been seated, moved away. I waited that return, but soon the opening and shutting of a door informed me that they had re-entered the house. I listened a little longer. All was perfectly still. 
I listened more than an hour. I at last, at last I heard Monsieur Pelé come in and ascend to his chamber. Glancing once more towards the long front of the garden house, I perceived that its solitary light was at length extinguished. So for a time was my faith in love and friendship. I went to bed, but something feverish and fiery had got into my veins, which prevented me from sleeping much that night. And here we are. So we learned that Zoraidi and Pelé are to be married. And um, before that, Crimsworth had created this romantic scenario in his head in which he was falling in love with Mademoiselle Reuter and that she was returning his um, uh, feelings even more, that she started those, that she initiated the, the love exchange, let's say. But that's not the case. And so that ideal scenario that he had constructed in his mind is crumbled apart and he feels something fiery and feverish within him and that is jealousy. And this is where we leave off and next time we'll continue with, with chapters 13, 14 and 15. I hope you're enjoying um, The Professor by Charlotte Bronte. Definitely different from her masterpiece, Jane Eyre, the one we're discussing in the online course, Jane Eyre, A Journey into Victorian Literature. Very different works, this to The Professor and Jane Eyre, but it's interesting to, and very enriching to study an author's whole career. So The Professor was the first book that Charles Bronte wrote, but the last to be published only posthumously. It was rejected by several publishers uh, before she, she sold Jane Eyre. So we'll see how the story, the stories go and we'll um, perhaps reach a conclusion at the end comparing these two works of literature. So thank you for joining me in this guided reading session. And I will see you again next week for session six of this guided reading of the profile. See you then.